Kia ora everyone, a warm welcome to everyone attending this webinar. My name is Abby Beetson and I am the Communications and Engagement Coordinator at NASLA, which is the National and State Libraries of Australasia. I would like to begin this webinar by acknowledging the traditional custodians and kaitiaki of the many lands from which our panelists and participants join us today. So a big warm welcome to all of you. This is the first in a series of webinars for 2023. And this webinar series is part of a year long celebration to celebrate NASLA's 50th anniversary. Um, and most importantly, to celebrate 50 years of library collaboration. Uh, today, we are here to learn about the iLab Missing Books Register and have an open discussion and sharing of experiences relating to missing books. And to support our conversation today, we have four really excellent speakers and panel members. And I'm going to briefly introduce you to them now. So we have Sally Burden, who's the immediate past president of the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers, which is called iLab. Um, and Sally is going to introduce us to the iLab Missing Books Register. We'll then hear from Dr. Jessica Gardner, who's the university librarian and director of library services at the University of Cambridge. And Jessica will share with us in a pre-recorded interview, the really remarkable story of the recovery of the Charles Darwin missing notebooks. And we'll then hear a case study from Anthony Tedeschi, who's the curator for rare books and fine printing at the National Library of New Zealand. And he will explain to us how he integrates the iLab missing books register into his daily workflows and provide us with an example of its use. Then finally joining us in a panel discussion Q&A session alongside Anthony and Sally is Maggie Patton. And Maggie is the head of collection acquisition and curation at the State Library of New South Wales. Um, and for this panel discussion, which will happen at the end of the webinar, we've allocated around 20 to 25 minutes for you in the audience to ask your questions. Um, and that's to ask your questions of the panel. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button, and this is where you can ask your questions. Um, please ask your questions throughout the webinar, including as we listen to our speakers. And at the end of the net webinar, we'll bring all of our panelists together for this Q&A session and get through as many of your questions as possible. And if you like a question that someone else has asked, you could also upvote it in the Q&A box to show that this question is also important to you. And this is done by clicking on the thumbs up icon which is next to that question. So I'd like now to invite Sally Burden to turn her video on and hand over to her to introduce us to the iLab's, iLab Missing Books Register. Thank you Abby and National and State Libraries Australasia. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to take part in this webinar today. As Abby said, my name is Sally Burden, and I'm speaking you to you today from our bookshop, Asia Book Room, which is situated in Canberra on the land of the Ngunnawal and Nanbury peoples. I wish to offer my respect to these peoples whose land we live and work on and to all First Nations peoples. I've been a second hand in the antiquarian book selling business for over 40 years and for 21 of those years, very actively involved in antiquarian trade issues. First on the Australian and New Zealand Association of Antiquarian Booksellers Board, and you may know um, that as ANZAB, and later for the last nine years on the committee of the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers, also more commonly called ILAB. 
iLab is the world umbrella body to which Anzab belongs, playing a role similar, I believe, to the one that IFLA plays in the library world. And last year, I stepped down from my then role as iLab president, but continue on the iLab committee today. Now, just sort of giving you a bit of background about my background so you can understand a little bit why I'm here and talking about this particular subject. Thanks to ANZAB's membership in iLab, the ANZAB booksellers you may be familiar with, with whom you may buy from or meet at the annual book fairs in Melbourne in July or in Sydney in October, are part of a worldwide network of approximately uh, 1,500 antiquarian booksellers. This network, uh, this extensive international group, consists of the most knowledgeable and expert booksellers globally, and all of whom are bound together by iLab's high ethical standards. Together, as iLab, these booksellers have developed an effective international network for reporting, tracking, and hopefully recovering items that have gone missing from library collections, private collectors, or booksellers' stock. Our proactive strategy revolves around two main components, an urgent international security email list and the Missing Books Register, sometimes called the MBR, website. The, the, the iLab security email list plays a really crucial role in our efforts. As soon as an item is reported missing to iLab, an email is sent to iLab booksellers worldwide, providing, with, providing them with comprehensive details and a thorough description of the missing items, I mean, as long as we've been provided with that. The email also includes information about whom to contact if the items are offered to them. Over the years, this security list has facilitated the return of numerous items and directly contributed to successful arrests. However, not all missing items are immediately offered for sale, and this is where the Missing Books Register comes into play. The Missing Books website represents the latest update of the original stolen books database, which some of you who have been around for a little while may be familiar with. Stolen Books Database was originally launched on the web in 2004, and then a really significant improvement was made to it in 2010 with a comprehensive rewrite of the site. So as you can see, iLab has been committed to working to returning missing items for a very long time. In fact, even before the event, the advent of this email security list, uh, many countries, including Australia and New Zealand, operated telephone networks. As technology advanced, iLab has been keen to embrace the innovations it offered. Consequently, since the first launch of the Stolen Books database, numerous enhancements have been made, such as the inclusion of images and strategies to ensure that the listings on the new missing books register launched only last year are as up-to-date as possible. This might be um, a good moment for me to just share my screen with you and show you the, uh, the, what the missing books register looks like. You'll see the buttons along the top here, you, where to report things, to search, and there's also quite a lot of guidance sheets that we have, which we have um, uh, put up for, there's one for library, libraries, there's one for collectors, there's one for booksellers, and there's also one for the law enforcement um, group. So um, I would really suggest that you have a bit of a look at the Missing Books Register. Listing and searching on the Missing Books Register is free and available to all. iLab's really keen to spread the news about what we can offer you. In general, the best way to stop books going missing from our shelves is to curtail their saleability. Making sure that booksellers and auction houses know an item is missing plays a very large part in this battle. And I can assure you that booksellers do not want to buy an item that has any sort of question mark against it being legitimately offered for sale. Help us to help you. List any items whose whereabouts you cannot account for with, importantly, as much copy-specific information as you can. This is so important. 
Books are rarely unique items. And to be able to prove that this copy belongs back in your collection requires details that indicates it's your copy. It could be something as simple as a library stamp, a book plate of a collector, a closed tear on page six, information on the binding of a rebound book, or the exact measurements of your copy, which, for example, the margins have been trimmed on, so it could be the only copy in the world that matches exactly. We are aware that it's not always simple to publicly announce that you can't find items in your collection. And it is for this reason ILAP has made sure that items may be listed on the missing books register without the name of the institution or person being publicly displayed. In a case such as this, if someone were to locate an item, they would be direct to contact the ILAB secretariat who would consult the data only visible to ILAB administration and contact the person or institution who listed the item missing. We very much hope that listing missing items on the ILAB missing books register will be included in the crisis or disaster plans of your library and institutions around the world. Book theft is an international business. Stolen in Sydney today, sold in New York tomorrow is a very real scenario these days. It happens, but thanks to the security email mailing list and the missing books register, similarly fast international transactions have been stopped and led to the arrest of people who are involved, as it happens, not just in stealing books, but other portable um, high value items. Lastly, I would like to make two additional points. While I have emphasized the importance of reporting promptly, it is never, never too late to report a missing item. Sometimes missing items are recovered years later. If something is missing, report it now. It doesn't matter if it vanished years ago. What matters is that the information is available to prevent the item from changing hands once again. If you have multiple items to report, please contact the ILAB Secretariat. Their contact details can be found on the Missing Books Register site, and you can request a template for reporting multiple items. This will save you a considerable amount of time. Of course, we hope you never need to be availing yourself of this template. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sally, for giving us an introduction to the ILAB Missing Books Register. That was a really terrific introduction, thank you. And this is a really good time to remind everyone to keep adding your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And as I said before, we've got plenty of time at the end of the webinar for your questions to be put to the panel. I would like to now share a story with you that made headlines around the world. This is an incredible story, and we're lucky enough to have the person at the heart of it tell it to us in a pre-recorded interview. And this is an interview with Dr. Jessica Gardner, and she will share with us the remarkable story of the recovery of the Charles Darwin missing notebooks. Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure, Abby, uh, to join you and, uh, you know, to be able to share the lessons that we went through uh, when we were planning our appeal for the return of the Darwin Notebooks. We were really blessed by the range of people who helped us behind the scenes. And I think that responsibility to kind of keep sharing that knowledge and connecting with our peers so we can all learn from the different experiences, um, long past, more contemporary, and as the worst happens into the future, then it's a pleasure to be with you in that context. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, would you be able to tell us a bit about the story of the successful recovery of the Charles Darwin notebooks? With, with absolute pleasure, or at least it is a pleasure now. It wasn't <laughs> when we set out on this uh, on this endeavor, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But first and foremost, I just wanna say, um, I am so proud of what we do at the University Library of Cambridge. We have a, an incredible tradition over centuries actually of caring for um, collections that have significance around the world. And I, I, I think that, you know, we should all be proud of what we do in that space at the same time as knowing that sometimes things go wrong and then you have to deal with them 
and that's a task, isn't it, to 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 address the problems as they come up. Um, in terms of what happened, um, I guess just to go back a little bit of time first, uh, I joined the University Library in 2017. Uh, incredibly excited about that, you know, an absolute career high for me. Uh, and I'd spent my early career working within special collections uh, before taking on director roles. So I very much understood and appreciated and felt connected to the unique and distinct archives, manuscripts and artifacts in our care. I was really devastated to learn within my first few weeks of the job that a pair of very significant collection items from the Charles Darwin archive were missing uh, and had been for some time. Uh, and then to also understand that those items were a pair of notebooks, uh, tiny notebooks about the size of postcards, um, scruffy brown leather that would have been held in Charles Darwin's hands and in his pockets when he went on visits around the country after his return from the Beagle voyage. And one of those, Notebook B, these were labelled alphabetically by Darwin himself, contained perhaps the most important sketch in the history of the life sciences, which is the Tree of Life. Yep. And um, as we go through, I can show an image of that in the Tree of Life. Um, has a tiny little wording at the top that says, I think, which makes it so precious because you're right inside of Darwin's mind when you see that. And this tree of life, I kid you not, it's on it's on tea towels, it's on tattoos, it's on cushions, it's on cards. You know, it is, it is perhaps the most well-known image in the history of life sciences. Yeah. So if there's one thing to find that was missing, that was absolutely devastating for all sorts of reasons. And then also to know that that was not publicly known. And that was a very complex knot to unpack, uh, including kind of issues that were cultural, governance, policy, um, physical, all of the um, aspects of dealing with something that was historic as an incident mm -hmm. and wanting to go in um, as a new team to be able to do everything we can to show we had left no stone unturned. So you should see on your screen now uh, the man himself, Charles Darwin, and in the background, that little tree of life that's peeking through. And that tree of life, better seen here, shows that sketch in Notebook B. Uh, what we learnt, because the first thing we tried to do was to understand all the facts in the past, and what we learnt was that in 2000, the notebook had been um, issued quite legitimately for a photography um, activity within the University Library's own services. And that photography we know took place, the record showed that it had been completed. The record then has a gap until January 2001, mm -hmm. where it was discerned that the little um, archival box holding the two notebooks was not where it should be on the vaults on the shelves. And we don't know why there was a gap between those two events. Uh, there's very little facts that we do know. But at that point, then, the library obviously began to take action to understand what had happened. And my predecessors acted with the knowledge they had available at the time um, on their understanding and their belief that the notebooks were missing. Uh, and you can understand why one would hope that was the case. And that led to searches over years, actually. Uh, we are a vast collection, over 200 kilometers of, um, of materials and vaults, which are over 50 kilometers of our special collections alone, and over 200 shells um, and many, many boxes of the Charles Darwin archive. And of course, you know, as we planned our own uh, strategy once I came in in 2020, 2017, we kind of redid those searches to make sure we had done absolutely everything to understand what had happened. In other words, then, the facts that we knew were relatively um, few, mm -hmm. uh, and, but we were determined that we couldn't stay in that position. And what we did was to begin to talk to external experts and to try and understand the different ways in which people had tackled this same issue. And I'll just stop sharing my screen. I would say that perhaps the most important aspects of this was actually talking outside the organisation, uh, to talk with colleagues in... Uh, specialist roles in collection uh, recovery and theft uh, and heritage recovery and theft. So colleagues in expert roles, for instance, in various in the UK, that's the Arts Council organisation, there will be equivalent um, in Australia and in New yeah. Zealand. 
uh, and also critically to the police. And there's a specialist unit in the Metropolitan Police for Art and Antiquities, which is very small, but I cannot thank them enough. They were so brilliant. I talked to peers in other uh, libraries around the world and learned about the issues they had faced and the ways they had tackled it and also took great heart from phenomenal stories, sometimes that meant recovery had taken place years and years after the incident. Um, Lambeth Palace Library lost a lot of books after the Second World War, for instance, yes. and they turned up in the 1970s on the deathbed uh, confession of someone who had taken them. Um, Durham University had a theft of a Shakespeare first folio, which 10 years after that occurred, uh, they were able to retrieve that and gradually kind of putting together these different examples and really talking openly to people about their own policies, about how they approach things. We led to a decision and it wasn't an easy one, but it was the right decision uh, to go towards a public appeal. And having got to that, that was a just incredibly important milestone, because for me, moving to an open and transparent position on this was clear in my mind as something we had to reach. But it's also important to get to a pathway that doesn't, well, that does the maximum to get those items returned. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to do that in the right kind of way. So uh, we then went forward to launch in in the end in Jan in, sorry, in November 2020, a public appeal. And it was a global storm. And they do not prepare you for this in library school uh, or in your <laughs> career, even if you work in a university like Cambridge, when there is a bit of a celebrity lens in terms of the kind of media attention. Uh, but we definitely talked to people in Sydney. Uh, we talked to people uh, in almost every country in the world. And I should just say that given um, the Missing Book Register is part of the yes. uh, discussion point in this webinar, a uh, very important part of what we did was to look at where we could report this loss uh, yes. in ways that would um, ensure that those who could help us around the world had the tools at their fingertips to identify if anything did surface, uh, for instance, in a sale or in some kind of context. Of course, that included reporting to the police formally and um, that being entered onto uh, the kind of European databases. Uh, but also um, at that time, it was the art loss register. But today we would be using the missing book register and we were talking to um, iLab um, just in advance of the appeal as well. We're enormously grateful for their support. Um, because that was also uh, quotations and support from the booksellers from the iLab in particular that we included in our public appeal. We're actually going to have uh, Sally um, from iLab um, talk the audience through the missing books register. So for those who aren't using it, they know that this is one of the most critical tools that can be used um, if a book is missing or suspected, uh, potentially stolen. I would like to get to the really enjoyable bit of this story. <laughs> um, I think this captivated all of us uh, when it happened. Could you tell us about how the missing notebooks, which I think had been missing for nearly 20 years, um, and you did your appeal, and I think it was around 15 months from the appeal to when they were returned. Can you tell us what happened and how they got returned to Cambridge University? <laughs> I can, and I kind of feel like after this moment I should have retired because it'll never get this good again. Um, I mean, the, the the facts are relatively simple, but they are absolutely extraordinary. And, I, and I'll share my screen again in a minute to sort of show you a little bit about that. Um, the notebooks were returned anonymously, physically to the University Library on March the 9th, 2022. And they had first been recorded missing, as you say, just over 20 years ago. So that was January, January 2001 when that um, missing, um, they, they were discovered to have been missing. Mm. So, yeah, about 15 months after the public appeal, things had gone very quiet. You know, initially, there's an awful lot of flood of information that comes in from the public, uh, a lot of which is just very strange. <laughs> all of which, we, you know, conspiracy theories, all sorts of things came in. And we passed them all on to the police formally. Uh, but after, you know, the first 12 months, things had gone very quiet. Uh, and I guess, you know, my my hope was they would come back sometime or that we would find out more. But it had gone quiet in my time. On the morning of March the 9th, 2022, it turns out that after the library had opened, and we don't know the exact time, but not long after the library had opened, perhaps half an hour or so, uh, my executive assistant had uh, picked up um, a parcel from outside the door to the office suite in which I sit. Uh, and actually, with all the best will in the world, she put it to one side because it said, Happy Easter. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she put it to one side and, um, you know, when she had a, a, a little uh, short break, uh, 
um, she had to look inside and to her absolute credit, she immediately called um, in the troops, which was our chief operating officer and our head of communications, Stuart Roberts. Kirsty immediately called the police. They knew what they were looking at and started reporting uh, what had happened. What they found was a large um, pink gift bag. Mm. Uh, inside that was a large brown office envelope with a printed note on it. That printed note said, Librarian, Happy Easter and a Kiss. Uh, inside that uh, brown envelope was two very tightly, sorry, a very tightly cling, flap, cling film wrapped package yes. through which you could see a scuffed brown leather um, cover and some brass clips immediately identifiable to those of us who had poured over the images of these items when we moved towards public appeal as looking like the notebooks. And also inside that bright pink gift bag was an archival box, which we immediately understood to be uh, one that had been produced in our conservation unit in the 1980s when the Darwin uh, archive was first being conserved or was, was going through some, some work. So that was an extraordinary moment. And then we were uh, in a period as, as quickly as we could over two weeks because we knew we, we could not sit on this and we wanted uh -huh. to tell the world and give our thanks. Uh, we, over two weeks, had to go through again an intense period of authentication. And again, we worked with the book trade. We worked with uh, a fantastic antiquarian um, bookseller uh, called Type and Form, who have expertise in 19th century science and indeed have been working on some Darwin material uh, at uh, Darwin's own house, Down House in Kent. Then we sat in my office with a expert team, uh, head of conservation, Jim Bloxham at the time, with the steadiest hands to open that little cling film package. Uh, our head and keeper of archives, uh, who herself uh, is an expert in scientific uh, heritage. And we went through page by page. And Jim, bless him, he's so brilliant. Uh, uh, one of the ways he was brilliant was the rigour. So there was me jumping up and down saying, but Jim, in notebook B, is page 36 there? Page 36 is the tree of life. Of and he just went through page by page. And... So, you know, to make sure everything was there, which is one, exactly what it should have been. But when we opened page 36, I think all of our hearts just leapt. It was there. Uh, and at, so then it went through further stages of, of authentication. Our keeper uh, of archives, Katrina Dean, went through with all the transcriptions and the digital copies because these were fully intellectually available already, despite the missing notebooks as a sacred historic object. So mm. she was able to check that against all the scholarly work that had happened on the notebook, notebooks in the past. Uh, absolutely rigorously there was no doubt in our minds but we needed to make sure that was externally done so conservation team did also a check uh, our academic uh, experts did a check on the basis of their knowledge of the we had a 50 we have a, a, a we had until the end of december last year a humanities project that's been running for nearly 50 years working on darwin's correspondence so the expertise yeah. of that academic team working in the library at that time to be able to identify not simply the writing but the ink that was used at different times in his work so to understand yes this was uh, it, what would he, they would be expecting to find in terms of the paper um, and the ink uh, from 1837 when these notebooks were written and then finally getting in type and form. And only after that well, did we feel we could confidently go out and say, these are home, these are home, wow. and just celebrate. This is when the notebooks were returned and the publicity, and you can see that that also hit many, many different news outlets around the world. One of my favourites was from Private Eye, this wonderful little sketch um, by an artist called Robert Thompson. And we did buy the original artwork from that so we can keep it with our archive of the uh, Charles Darwin's return notebooks with the kind of evolution from the amoeba going forward. And again, just really sort of celebrating uh, the return. So this is the package that the items returned in. And they... Uh, went to the police uh, who held them in evidence in case additional information came forward which they could triangulate any forensic evidence. Now, in the end, it didn't. Uh, and we have just learnt that they are now um, going to release these items back to us as no longer being appropriate to be held in evidence. Essentially, the case is closed. Mm -hmm. We had to, of course, give this evidence across to the police. Um, they did initially want to take the notebooks themselves, and we were adamant they were not leaving the building. And here we are in my office. This is uh, Dr. Katrina Dean uh, uh, and Jim Bloxon, our then head of conservation. And you can see Jim holding that notebook um, and Katrina checking it against typescripts, both the published version 
uh, a tri TypeScript printout that she's got. And also on her laptop is the microfilm version um, and the digital version, which were available publicly while these notebooks were missing, but of course not the same as the object. So yeah, quite an extraordinary sensation. This particular image showing the, I think, as we go inside Darwin's mind, I will never get over uh, seeing that for the first time. So I really want to ask, um, have the policies and processes of Cambridge University Library changed since the experience of the Darwin notebooks going missing, being returned? Um, yeah, could you tell us more about this? Yeah, and, and I would say that they have changed actually over the last two decades. You know, I, and we were a good organisation then, but something went wrong. Uh, also, at that time, um, you know, this is this is not intended excuse. It's just a fact at the time. The building was quite disruptive because there was very substantial building work going on. So, oh. I guess there's a lot of learning as well in terms of how you approach all of those things and collection care. But, you know, we um, have incredibly rigorous security measures in place today, and those have built up over two decades. Uh, and we've obviously sought to strengthen them and keep strengthening them. And I think this is the the, the point really is that this is an area of continual improvement, isn't it? In all of our organisations, if you think mm. you're done on this, you know, yeah. go back to the beginning you're not it, yeah. is, it is about culture it is about practice it's about policy and it is about physical environment and it is about how you work with the organization around you in which you sit um, as well as with uh, your peers and the network and how you can keep benchmarking and learning with them uh, as well as if, with colleagues like in the in the book trade so we have um you know since since the time in which these uh, notebooks went missing in 2000 we have um, new reading rooms uh, yes. that were actually being built at that time um, for our specialist collections. We have uh, extended vaults and security arrangements around them, uh, high security strong rooms, just as you'd expect, ex enhanced perimeter and internal security, including CCTV, uh, as you would expect, all the usual um, access controls, specialist um, team, a 50 strong curatorial team and a dedicated security team on site that works with the university security team. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in 2018, um, so well before we launched this appeal, um, we were awarded archive accreditation, which is the national standard in the UK. So we've been working for, for, for really for some time towards making sure that we had that accreditation. It's the gold standard nationally for the quality of collection care for archives and manuscripts. And we also went root and branch through our policies. And so, you know, hand on heart, it can be very clear that if something of this significance uh, was missing, or found to be missing, the escalation process for that would be very, very quick. Yes. Uh, and the escalation process to the police would be a part of that because we just don't want to uh, shut down our thinking in the future. You know, we would want to be continuing all the internal processes in the event of any significant object going missing. Mm. Um, I'm not trying to imply there are insignificant objects, but clearly if you have a vast collection, you're also making a choice between the book that's on the open shelves and, and something of this calibre. It's very, very different. Um, you all you will understand that. Everyone will understand that. But um, so you, we would have the kind of police uh, uh, informed as a potential theft at the same time as going through those internal processes and, and really the kind of the internal governance aspects, which we... Um, we, we underst undertook retrospectively would be happening from day one and we were enormously grateful because we you know went through our policies particularly around our specialist collections with input from colleagues at the British Library here uh, and in, in conversation with peers um, in the European network there's a consortium of European research libraries called CERL which spends a lot of time uh, looking at cultural uh, security and care uh, we had already done some benchmarking with them to understand you know our position and to look at what else we could do uh, we weren't in a we, we were actually in a, in a good place but we mm. wanted to make sure we could go further um and so within that we also then commissioned an external audit um through um, an external company called trident manor uh, who we then worked with as well so uh, i am very confident today if something like this happened and you know, please let it not but should it because we are human yeah uh, then, you know, we have policies and places which would allow us to act, but we're not stopping there. We have a security committee that meets regularly that has external membership on that to help keep us transparent. Uh, and we um, have built in reporting um, and uh, audit mechanisms with our own internal management board, which um, needed to be strengthened as well. So I really want to get your advice to our audience, um, which as you know, is, is going to be many different um, librarians from different libraries on what your advice to them 
if they were dealing with a similar situation of missing or potentially stolen items in their collections? Let's say it's just happened, they could get on the phone to you. What would you tell them? I mean, you have to work within the context you are, but I think you have to work towards bringing that information into the light. And I, I, I think, you know, it is it is a very highly charged situation because these do speak to the very heart of our practice and our mission. And I think, therefore, you cannot do these things alone. You need to have a, a team around you that you are, can can work with. It, it's you're, you're dealing with crisis and incident management at that point, aren't you? Exactly. And you're having to to refocus your time uh, and that sort of painful process of letting go of what you thought you were doing, uh, whether that is short term or longer term, in order to to focus on this piece. So, I so work towards bringing it into the light, act very quickly to bring in the experts externally. That is also critically for tr critical transparency, but they also bring in expertise with them. And you should be able to work with your police in a way that they are also keen to make sure that the, the, the communications around that are handled well, because they're invested in that too, in terms of, of you know making sure they have the best opportunities to get things back. So it's not as if kind of going into that act is one that exposes you, actually it, it, it builds strength and resilience to you. And I'd say that also then to the, to the book trade and you know you, you may feel that you want to talk to someone and you know in iLab first for instance mm -hmm. to try and get advice you know so yeah. don't feel you have to do things on your own work towards bringing something to light get your project team around you um but get help and get that external help in because these things are hard to do on your own it's a lot to carry and I'd say it's a lot to carry as a leader as a director um you know you and you don't have to do that on your own so uh, I'm happy to go into further details with anyone who's facing something and pick up the phone and have a conversation and also share the contacts that I have because, um, you know, I, 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 I learned a lot, but that learning was was built on the shoulders of people who were incredibly experienced and had also gone through uh, different aspects. And the only final thing I'd say is, is that this is an ongoing process, you know, yeah. and and. You know, if you if you can find a way to be kind of gradually building up more and more understanding of what is not in your collections, using your catalogues as just a just a just the regular way in which you are recording that something is missing. So it becomes, there's a normalized aspect. It, it is it is clearly unusual to be dealing with something of quite such cultural significance that we were. But it does happen. But it's kind of thinking about it all down the chain for different things and how you can connect up across that piece. So, so yes, if, if someone's in a similar position, do do let me know. I'm happy to kind of talk through because some of this is actually just feeling like you're not alone. Um, yes. But work to bring it into the light and don't try to do that all internally. Get the experts externally on side and helping you. Thank you so much for sharing this story with us and sharing it with um, your Australasian library colleagues. Um, and we're just so grateful to have you on this. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Abby, um, and to everyone uh, out there. Sorry not to join you in person, but really pleased to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was amazing to hear from Jessica, and I would like to thank her again for taking the time to participate in this webinar. Our final speaker before we move to the panel session is Anthony Tedeschi. And Anthony is going to explain to us how he integrates the iLab Missing Books Register into his daily workflows and provide us with an example of its use. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks so much, Abby. And thank you for the opportunity to contribute uh, to this webinar. Um, I'll keep my comments brief so we can uh, dive into the Q&A. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion, and I hope there are good questions being generated. Uh, but first, that was really brilliant. Um, it was great to see someone like Jessica speaking so openly and so freely, not only about um, the theft and return of the Darwin notebooks, but also the institutional changes um, implemented as a result. And I hope it will encourage other institutions uh, who find themselves in a similar unfortunate situation to seek external help if needed uh, by reporting to the missing books register, for example, uh, once all internal mechanisms or protocols in place to locate missing items um, have been exhausted. Uh, we may return brief briefly to that during the Q&A if there's time. So now one of my roles as a curator with the Alexander Turnbull Library is to acquire material for the rare books and fine printing collection, working primarily with dealers like Sally and private owners. Part of the acquisition process is to find out 
as much as possible about a book's provenance or chain of ownership and document this step to demonstrate the application of due diligence in the acquisition. This includes a conversation with the dealer or private owner, uh, offering the material, checking recent auction records, and so on. So I'd say since around 2011 <clears throat> or so, I've been incorporating um, a search of the databases maintained by iLab. Uh, first, the stolen books database, and now the missing books register as part of this process. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank Sally and everyone involved in the redevelopment uh, for the name change. Um, because as we know, not all missing books are indeed stolen. So I'm relieved to say that in my 12 years of consulting these databases, I've only ever had one um, search result turn up a match. So that's quite a hit rate. In 2017, a member of the book trade offered the Turnbull Library an illustrated early 18th century French natural history text concerning the East Indies. And it was a publication known to have been amongst Joseph, Joseph Banks's uh, books kept aboard the Endeavor. And although the copy offered was not Banks's copy, I think this is held by the British Library, I believe, works consulted by Cook and Banks during the first voyage are of interest from a collecting standpoint, given their relevance to the Turnbull Library's rich collection of voyaging texts. So you can imagine my reaction then when I saw this same title and edition listed in the MBR. The description of the binding was different from the binding on the copy being offered, so there was a variation and this copy specific information is vital. And I second Sally's call to record as many of the unique physical facets, not only if you have to report a missing item to the MBR, but also in catalog records ahead of time. Um, it is that sort of enhanced description that acts as a level of security, as well as interest points for research. So after a much needed cup of tea, I wrote a very carefully worded email to the dealer, alerting him to this discovery. So Sally noted, dealers have no desire to handle potentially stolen books any more than curators or librarians do. And in no way did I want to come across as if, as if I was making an accusation or that, you know, accusing her of being involved in any way of possibly handling a stolen object. So fortunately, he understood my caution. And after further correspondence and a more detailed examination of the binding, um, we were satisfied that the two copies were not one and the same. And so we proceeded with the acquisition. Uh, a very happy result for all involved. And I recently checked the missing books register and see it's no longer listed. So hopefully that means that copy has been found and returned to its, its rightful owners. And on that note, I'll also add in my support of the ability to provide information to the missing books register anonymously. Um, if it's a brilliant addition, there's no need to involve anyone for anyone to be known except for the owner of the object and iLab, really. After that, it's up to you if you wanna take it further. And then my last point really is just as mentioned by Sally and Abby, another potential use of the MBR is the incorporation of its reporting function into a disaster or risk management plan. And I raise this point um, as it is a discussion worth having, I think, uh, for any colleagues who are watching to have with your management team or your collection care staff. So at the Turnbull Library, we have a disaster plan. We also have a set of separate steps if an item is identified as being missing. But in terms of reporting to MBR, that's not part of this. So this is something that may um, take forward for us to discuss as well. Thank you. Now back to you and to the Q&A.
Thank you so much, Anthony. That was such a brilliant um, case study to provide to us. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to keep your video on as we invite Sally and Maggie to also join us on the panel session. And we're just going to start and have a look at some of the questions that we've got up from the audience. So the first one is from Igor. And he says, thank you, Sally, for your talk. Apart from books, are there any other formats, photographs, maps, sheets of music, etc., recorded in the Missing Books Register? Igor, thank you so much for your question, because I am a fool not to have said yes, absolutely. I can't believe it, especially as someone who deals a lot in ephemera. Um, yes, uh, we call it the Missing Books Register because um, we actually came up with this name thanks to um, iLab's work with IFLA, hence the, the missing aspect rather than the stolen. But we kind of got stuck with the books thing, but it's really anything on paper that you're likely to um, find antiquarian booksellers dealing with. So that could be um, ephemera, prints, maps, you know, music sheets, manuscripts, you name it. And as you probably anyone who's been to um, one of our book fairs will know there's a pretty diverse range of things we have. Anything like that is very welcome um, on the on the missing books register. Thank you for the question. Thank you for that answer, Sally. And that's a really good point that it's not just books. There's a whole array of material that the missing books register um, uh, you know, holds information on if something is either missing or potentially suspected stolen. We've got another question from Beth, and she says, I've done some searches, Australia, Australian, Sydney, Melbourne, Victoria, and not got results. Have Australian institutions contributed to the missing books register to date? Have there been results? And that's another question for you, Sally. I actually don't know whether, uh, certainly Australians have contributed, um, <coughs> not, not hugely. And this is one of the very reasons I'm so delighted to have this opportunity today to talk with you is that um, we're really in the, in the early days with the Missing Books Register. And obviously it's not our hope that there'll be millions of things on there because then that shows there's a kind of failure of not, we're not managing to keep our, our things under control. But, um, you know, we really do need people to report more because I know of um, people have mentioned in passing things. I've got, oh, I didn't know that's not on the missing books register. And so it is still fairly focused on other parts of the world. And actually the things that I know that have been uploaded from Australia don't relate to Australia. As it happens, they've just been Australians uploading Western canon type material. Um, but uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that, but uh, we would love you to um, upload material that you, you know, names of things that you know is uh, missing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally. And it's a really important point that this is the time we're raising awareness now of the missing books register. So from now, you know, going on that snowball effect of getting everybody to use it. And this um, very much uh, relates to my uh, next question, which is for Anthony and for Maggie. And this is a question actually from the audience, um, but was sent to me in advance of the webinar. And they say, what are the best practices for the physical marking of rare books when it comes to theft prevention and recovery? I might let Maggie jump in first on this. Oh, okay. Um, I think um, we've had a few occasions in the past where things have, oh, actually, let me start by saying that I think no one likes to say something's been stolen. So Sally, calling it the missing books is great. And we do have quite a long list of things that have been missing, some for many years, which we always believe are misshelved. And I think that we will probably think about putting some of these on the missing books list now, because as you say, it's anonymous. It, it doesn't hurt to put some things up there. So that's very, we'll be thinking about that. Okay, um, look, we've had quite a few incidents in the past and certainly the best thing for us has been what is all sometimes hideous is the library stamp. And people have certainly found things with the Mitchell or the Free Public Library stamp on it. 
and they have been able to contact us immediately. We've also had some where the just the um, the um, embossing or something like that or a book plate in the front has been um, the reason that we've been contacted. And we are currently um, in the process of investigating um, micro embossing um, uh, in a secret place of which we can't yet agree um, so that for particular um, items so that we can make them additionally secure. Um, I think also, as you were saying before, the best description of the item is also important. Um, and we've had a lot of work done recently to upgrade some of our rarer, more significant items and really to describe it thoroughly. You know, when they were first catalogued 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago, they might not have added the number of missing plates or they might not have added changes to the title pages, that sort of thing, the collations. So I think that's the other thing. I know we can't afford to do brilliant descriptions on everything, but I think when you can, that's really important. Yeah, absolutely agree with that, Maggie. I know, um, I'm trying to think the advice in, was that security guidelines or considerations yes. for a special, yeah, yeah. So this is a recommendation of two marks, sort of a very highly visible one, book plate or a stamp, and then a more discreet um, security mark somewhere in the in the item is sort of the recommendation. And I know there's sort of this long discussion about not marking rare books because you know it affects the aesthetics or the value or whatever. But without adding uh, provenance evidence like a stamp or a book plate, etc., you're not recording your institution's history of the object. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's highly present not only for current security reasons, but going forward in terms of historic research of your own collection to have that mark present in the copy. You certainly will have conversations because we acquired something a few years ago, um, incredibly rare. And um, there was a lot, you know, the conservation team were very um, resistant about adding any marks to it. But mm. really, you need to be able to do that. And I sometimes um, think it's interesting the difference between the way we um, handle original works on paper as opposed to rare books. So to emboss or to create a secret mark on, on a rare book is quite expected. But to do that with a, a rare original manuscript, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Thank you so much for answering that question. And um, I think this very much relates to my next question, for Sally, is there a capacity for the register to show items that have been recovered and include information about the recovery process? There, there isn't actually a sort of way that you can search on there, but there is a news section on the missing books register. Um, and uh, if you looked under that, that's the sort of place we could put that sort of thing. Um, I'll certainly talk to my, we haven't really thought of that um, before, and it's a good one. Um, I'd certainly talk to people at iLab about this. The only thing is sometimes the whole thing is, as you know, there are various privacy concerns, and that's why we certainly couldn't do it for everything. But um, yeah, no, I think it's a it's a good, very positive suggestion. It's nice to to hear some of the ins and outs, especially if it ends up in an arrest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doesn't the um, RBMS or the Rare Books and Manuscripts section or ALA their security? site don't they list sort of news stories and recoveries is that is that correct right i think so i'm, I'm not yeah. positive actually. i think i've heard about it. i haven't actually seen it i must okay. check it out thank you now that that was a good answer sally um and we're going back now to another question from nina um this is about the stamping of books again so this is a, something that people are thinking about and she asks if there is a particular location you would recommend for, I can see Maggie laughing there, if you could, a particular location, you would recommend for stamping books. Um, and then she says, some people discourage end paper stamping as they can be removed, which is an important point. And what are your stamping policies for plates? Well, I'm sure that we have a stamping policy, but I don't, as I don't stamp the books, I'm not quite sure, but I do know that there is, we certainly do stamp within the book, 
the book as well as um, on the outer pages. As you say, they can easily be removed. Um, we also have a policy where we don't stamp rare material. We um, have a small embosser, uh, which we use for rare material. Um, but I would I not encourage you to adopt the policy that we had in 1869 when the Free Public Library of Sydney began, which was to stamp every 50th page and every plate, which was why we have stamps on the beaks of birds and things, because they really wanted to deter people from ripping out plates from books. So don't follow the 1870s model. But certainly, yes, I, I would presume most libraries would have a stamping policy, and I don't know it at hand, but yes, we do. Mm -hmm. We don't stamp as far as I know, so it's, yeah. Interesting, very interesting. Oh, um, you don't stamp. Oh, no, there's no, a conversation. as far as I know. And, <laughs> and indeed, indeed. I know, I think stamping was the um, preferred method in the security guidelines. Um, and I'm not sure if I get this right or if they still do it, but the Library of Congress offers a certain particular type of ink that you used to yes. just order through them. Is that right, Maggie? Yes, I think, yeah, I've sort of seen that. Stress definitely. tested and that sort of thing. Yes. I also think, I mean, for us also, the stamp is a fantastic provenance mm. because we know the stamps have changed over time. So we, we can know even in the 20th century when we've actually acquired something from the stamp that we've actually used. So yeah. uh, it has its advantages. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've got lots of questions coming in, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, the next one is from Linda. And she said, and this is a, a very interesting question. She says, will the register of missing items always be for physical items? Will there be a potential to begin logging missing sound, film, digital data? And I think that's a very relevant question for today. So Sally, I'll go over to you. Thank you, Linda. That's a great question. And this is exactly another of the reasons that we want to be out here talking about the missing books um, register, because quite honestly, we hadn't considered that because we live in the world of antiquarian books. But as you probably seen, if you go to um, book fairs, a lot of people, are, including myself, are dealing a lot in 20th century material and antiquarian doesn't necessarily mean old nowadays. It can just mean special, basically. Um, so that's a great question. And I'm not saying no. At the moment, it's not something that it's set up to do, although I guess there's no reason why you couldn't um, just fill in the fields where, you know, in this with this sort of thing. But um, yeah, I'll put that to my colleagues at iLab. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking that question, Linda. Um, we've got one more question from Beth. And um, she says, Sally referred to anything on paper that may be handled by the antiquitine, antiquarian, it's always a hard word to say, books dealer as being in scope for the register. So this is a similar question as the one before. Is any non-paper such as uh, Raelia in scope, such as some Raelia in scope, e.g. Um, military medals, buttons, insignia, insignia, can't even say those words. Um, Sally, over to you. Um, I think that's also a wonderful question, Beth. And uh, I guess my answer is the same. Actually, at the moment, we hadn't really thought of this. I can't believe this since I was kind of a major part of the setting up of some of the structures here. Well, not the programming, but the. Um, but uh, it's a very good question. I mean, really, with sort of art and things, there are things like the art loss register, and some of the realia would go to that. So, you know, so if it was ceramics or paintings or, you know, the art loss register has all sorts of things. So I guess there comes a point where it is outside our scope. Um, but I'll certainly, you know, talk to my colleagues on the iLab committee about that, because it's, it's true. There is, um, there's a lot of interest in these things. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Now I'm going to go to Anthony and Maggie, and this is a slightly um, different question from the one we've had before, but I really do want to ask, if you could time travel, you could go back in time and witness the creation of, of one rare or valuable book, um, which one would it be and why? <laughs> you go first, Anthony. Okay. All right. Well. 
you know, I think the the Lindisfarne Gospels, um, which is a what uh, early eighth century medieval manuscript uh, held by the British Library, and it's just the most exquisite thing if you ever get a chance to see it, or just look it up on Google Images. That's uh, Lindisfarne Gospels, and I would love to stand behind uh, Aedfrith, the monk who did the illustrations and the design of it. Such so intricate knot work. It's so complex. I just can't quite get my head around how how he did it. Um, careful layout, I presume. Um, but it's just a stunning object, and just to watch someone like that work, a master like that work, would be a real privilege. Thank you. Uh, Maggie? Well, because it's the 400th anniversary of the publication of the first folio, I would have to say the first folio because it would be fantastic to really be there as the two actors are choosing which plays to include. Did they have arguments? Did they choose the ones they liked? Uh, was there some reason? Could we have a whole lot of other plays in there if they'd had a better day? Um, all sorts of things like that because we know that there are a whole lot of plays in there that would have been lost without the first polio, but are there even more that are lost? And we know that thousands of plays were written through the period. So I just think the whole putting together of the first polio um, and the, the stories around it, you know, they had to, they they didn't do it from one end to the other. They, they printed things as they got permission. So why are they in the order that they are in? All sorts of things. So I would say um, Shakespeare's first folio. And because we own one and we're going to have an exhibition this year, I'd say you can all come along and have a look at the one that we have here to see one as it exists now. But I think the first folio would be my choice. Uh, thank you so much, Sally. So we may not be able to do time travel, but at least we can come to your library and have a look at it. So, um, no, thank you. And we've got another question from the audience from um, Marie. And this is again from Anthony and Maggie. How do you keep records of significant high, val high value collection items? Do you keep additional records aside from metadata? So for example, photographs kept in a record keeping system or similar? Uh, yes, we do. So we, there's a number of answers to this question. One is we do a five yearly program of valuing our collection, um, although we roll it over five years, so we're not doing the whole thing in one year now. Um, that includes a number of things that we will have identified as individually valued items. So every five years, these items will be individually valued by a valuer. And so depending on what they are, it might it's um, a book worth over 50,000, a painting worth over 100,000. And so we actually have them um, both tagged in the metadata secretly um, and that way we can export and check them regularly and update. So we certainly have a very methodic way of um, um, identifying those high value items and consistently checking them. So every we will also do a regular stock take to find out to make sure that they're on the shelf and they're not missing. Uh, we've also developed um, sort of a separately a bit of a database as part of our system, which helps us to record that material as well. So we have, yeah, we have very systematically recorded high value items across all formats. Mm. Again, very similar answer again. Mm. Um, so we value every three years um, the collection. We're going through it right now, actually, as I, as I speak. Um, and so for the rare books collection, the same thing, maintain a separate uh, database set of high value items um, and then behind the scenes in the in the back end catalog that details are captured like that so as Maggie noted that can be generated as a report if needed and always get signed on and that can things can go on if you discover something else in the collection mm -hmm. that's value suddenly increasing so it's not sort of set in stone as it were. Yep, that's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you, both of you. Um, Sally, one thing I was wondering about, and we have a question um, about this here, is how do you collaborate with law enforcement? And, and I'm assuming there are dedica dedicated departments, I'm wondering in 
all of the countries of the world, I don't know. Um, but you know, how do you collaborate them, collaborate with them when you're handling a case of a missing book? Thank you. Yeah, it's generally, um, yes, yes, there's, uh, I guess there's two parts to this answer. If it's me as a, as a, um, individual um one of the things i would do as a as a bookseller is contact you know the local law if you know what i mean and often hopefully that they'll get involved um if it's a high enough value and it's possibly an international situation of course interpol has um offices all over the place including in australia and no doubt in new zealand as well so usually i don't think they'll look at you know very cheap items but um with other things they they can be more interested um answering for for the um, missing books register here, um, we are in a process. We have some really good relationships with uh, in some countries already, um, where there's been uh, you know ongoing toing and froing between dealers and the and the law enforcement people. Um, but we are very much in a promoting the missing books register to um, the law enforcement officials at this moment. Um, that's one of our big things for this year. Um, and so if anybody has any any links with anybody that they'd like to share, that would be great, because one of the things we do find is, this, you know, uh, police and people like that move on. And so often the person you had or the office name is completely changed. And, you know, keeping up with um, this sort of thing is is um, quite a quite a business. So. <laughs> But there is um, on the missing books register where I was showing you the uh, documents to help people. We've we've written one for law enforcement officials to sort of to help them, um, you know, uh, use the missing books register. We are very keen to cooperate with all the stakeholders, so library people, collectors, law enforcement, insurance people, whoever. Um, and there are lots of different people who are interested in this subject from their own angles, and of course booksellers. <laughs> I'll Anthony, just add from a please, Anthony. on an institutional side, I mean, you may wind up being contacted by law enforcement if stolen items have been recovered. Um, and if they're wondering if it belongs to your library, I mean, there was a, the example I'm thinking of was a series of thefts from a number of New Zealand, I think university collections, say 2005, around that time, six. And so they caught the thieves and recovered some of the material. And I'd been working in the country for about a year at that point, 2007, and we were approached by two officers who had five or six books that they wanted to confirm if they were from the special collections or not at the public library. They weren't in the end, but that may, there's another involvement as well, not so much our contacting them with something missing, but diversely, we have these books, are these yours? That's a really good point. And as, as Sally said, working with all the stakeholders from the police to, and you mentioned insurers as well, Sally, mm -hmm. and um, we've actually, Nina's submitted a follow-up question for Anthony and Maggie about insurers. And it's what role do insurers play in record keeping requirements? Um, etc. And Sally, a question for you, which is part of this question, are insurers involved in the missing books register at the iLab end? And also she asks, do you know if you use an individual insurance policy for particular high value items or a more generic blanket policy? Who should go first? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, um, so you go from um from the bookseller's view first. Right. Okay. Um, and so the question, um, I presume when it's you, I mean, obviously the missing books register um, is delighted if um, anybody would like to consult whatever their um, situation is, would like to consult it. It's always free to look at and um, we hope that insurers will use it as well. Other than that, I mean, other than getting the word out to them and making them aware that um, it exists and they can use it. Um, and we have had an, we had a, um, a, a symposium in New York in 2019 um, about um, stolen and uh, uh, stolen books and um, also fraud and various other uh, forgeries. 
Um, and we did have an insurance person speaking at that. I'm not quite sure in what way we could work in with them other than to happily support their work with anything, you know, with them using our, our data. Um, as far as an insurance policy goes, I mean, obviously the missing books uh, register is only just a place to share information, so it doesn't need one. As far as uh, myself as a dealer, and I think um, many other dealers would be like this, I certainly am insured for that sort of material, but, um, you know, we um, it's more on a blanket policy because they know we're dealing in material of, you know, some of it of a high-ish value, so... Um, our, the, the insurance, the government insurance that covers the collect the, the, the library color, you know, covers the collections as well. And we have had instances where um, the insurance policy has paid out on material um, that has um, been stolen. There was an unfortunate incident a few years ago where we lost some coins. Um, well, we didn't lose some coins, obviously, um, but we'll just use that euphemism. Um, and they were digitized, so it was very clear to identify them. And um, the police were brought in, and we had some great work with Jim Noble, who looks after coins in Sydney and knows a lot about them. And certainly, um, we had, you know, the the police were involved, the insurance was involved. So when you actually have the system set up, everyone works very collaboratively and shares information <coughs> and works together. Um, I think that once again, it's the documentation of what you hold um, and the records, which is very important for your insurance. Um, if anyone's interested in, a, in an old case around libraries and coin thefts, uh, there's a book which is called um, Heads I Win, the story of David G. And that's about some coin theft from the library. I think it was back in the 70s. And um, he ends up going to court, and it's a it's a great tale, could be turned into a movie. Um, but yeah, it tells you the whole trail of things that um, you know. He came into the library, he had some counterfeit coins, he swapped them over. Um, he was a very charming gentleman, gave flowers to the to the staff on the desk. Everyone thought he was very pleasant. Um, but it's a great tale, and it tells you, you know, you know, it's about your records and about how you provide access and security. Um, it's a good tale. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not much to add to that, really, is there? I mean, it's just similar to Maggie as a government department. Government insurers will come in if needed. Um, in terms of provenance recording, I mean, that's always good for um, Audit New Zealand. Mm -hmm. You know, occasionally, you know, once a year, the auditors may pluck an item from the collection and ask you to walk us through its acquisition to it being on the shelf and the steps along the way. And so demonstrating its chain of ownership and uh, its history is all part of that process. Thank you. Well, um, we've got five minutes left. So I'm actually, um, and we've got to the end of the attendees questions. So I've got two questions uh, that I'm one that I'm going to pose to Sally and one to Anthony and Maggie, but I'm going to say them both now. So Anthony and Maggie, <laughs> you can have a think about this where I, I put this, uh, my first question to Sally, but Anthony and Maggie, if you could recover one missing book from history, which book would it be and why? And if anybody in the audience wants to actually add their answers to that, you're very welcome. And while you have a think about that, I'm going to ask Sally her question, which is what are the long-term objectives for the iLab Missing Books Register? So where do you see yourself in 10 years time? Thank you. I hope that we'll be the absolute go-to place for, you know, that people will, both booksellers and libraries will consult. We won't even think twice about adding, you know, it's just, it's just there. It's just part of how we do things. So for libraries, it'll be part of, oh, gosh, unfortunately, we have this situation. We can't find X. Let's just put it up on the missing um, books register. We can always take it off. And in fact, one of the things when we were designing this new incarnation of, uh, of, the, of the website, the missing books register, one of the things we really realized was so important 
is that um, things be taken down once they're found. So, um, you know, because certainly from a dealer's point of view, um, you can't sell it if it's up on the missing books mm -hmm. register or you jolly well hope you couldn't sell it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the, the, what the, the register every few months sends out an automated email to people who have registered things and says, are you still missing this? you know, yes, no type thing. And um, so that it will be current and it can be something we will be relied on. I mean, I see the missing books, you know, obviously, you know, I've got two hats on here. One, obviously, I don't want it to have a lot of items on it. But the other angle is I do want it to have a lot of items on it because then people will know that, if you know, it'll become the gold standard place to go. And um, so, yes, that's... Did I answer the whole question? You absolutely <laughs> did. No, that, that, that was brilliant. And, and I agree with you. That, that would be just standard in pe people. As soon as something is missing, you know, irrelevant, if it's just lost for a couple of days on the missing books register, yep. using it as a standard part of their daily and crisis management plans. Right, Anthony and Maggie, um, final question that I've already provided to you. I'll hand it over. Right. Shall I go first? Or... Please, you go first. Okay. Um, I think um, <clears throat> Christopher Columbus's original journal and logbook from his first voyage to the Americas in the late 1490s, um, he presented that on his return to Queen Isabella of Castile, who had a copy made, which he gave to Columbus, and she kept the original. She died in 1504, and it's not been seen since. Um, the copy that was made passed to Columbus's son and then his grandson, and also has disappeared. So they're both missing. Oh, so wow. Either of them, or both of them. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, thank you. Gosh, um, I'm going to go straight to Maggie, because we've only got a couple of minutes so we can hear what she selected. Oh, look, I'm going to say two very quick ones. First one is in the 1870s, the public library got rid of a whole collection of cheap novels that they, learnt, they thought weren't worthy of reading. And they were given away to one of the Rose uh, asylums here in Sydney. And I don't know where they exist. They'll have stamps on them. But in the list that we have, there is definitely some Jane Austen. And we would love to know if the library had an earlier edition of Jane Austen, which someone just discarded as rubbish. <laughs> so have a look for cheap novels from the 18, 1870 around that period. Uh, the other thing I think is something that's a little bit like Anthony's. Um, Ptolemy um, in 150 AD was a geographer, a map maker, um, and he supposedly thought out this theory of, of um, and created a map of the world, but we don't know whether he actually ever created a map. He told us how to create a map. He gave us, all, gave us all of the coordinates for a map, but no one has ever found a map that he created. I'd like to find a Ptolemy map, please. <laughs> Wow, what amazing examples. I feel we could have a whole webinar just <laughs> on the missing books of history that we need to find <laughs> just hearing those stories. We've got one minute to go. I just want to say thank you so much to Jessica, Sally, Anthony and Maggie for giving up your time today to be with us on this webinar. And thank you to everybody in the audience who has submitted your questions and has been with us um, today. This session is being recorded. It'll be available on the NASLA YouTube channel after this. So um, you can go and share them with your colleagues or rewatch it again if you want to. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Oh, thank Thanks, you. Sally. Thanks, Abby. Anthony. Thanks, Ali and Maggie.